Uh, my name is Jason Engerman, and I'm here with Des Designers for Learning, and we are a nonprofit organization that links educational technologists, uh, instructional designers with um, nonprofit organizations to help develop OERs for adult basic education. And this is our very first Ed Impact Day towards our uh, funding campaign. Uh, to help develop out our software insurance, host the website, uh, among other things. One of the things we have going on is our MOOC, which will end December 4th uh, currently, uh, but will pick back up again in March. And so today we're talking to several educators and professionals across the education uh, spectrum to find out what impact they're going to make or they intend to make uh, within that sphere. And currently we have Paula Angela Escondra, who is a, a personal friend of mine, a great person uh, who works for Glass Lab. And let me uh, tell you a little bit about her. Paula serves as the head of content partnerships for Collective Shift, which is another 50C3 nonprofit organization striving to redesign systems of learning for the 21st century. She's invested um, she has vested interest in uh, games-based learning and connected learning principles toward 21st century youth development. Um, she's also, uh, let's see, Paula has worked uh, with Genesis Development Collaborative, focused on strategic planning for workforce development for refugees and free VR education focused on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. She's also has years of experience from the video game industry to redesign conversations in action around local youth empowerment and global resilience. She's also proud to have a dual degree holding an MBA and an MPA in sustainable management from Presidio Graduate School and a BA in cultural anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley. So we wanna say thank you for joining us. Welcome, Paula. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you, you got to where you are now? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for allowing me to be on here. I'm always a scheduling nightmare. And so this is like my relief <laughs> to be able to catch up and hang out. Um, it really means a lot, um, especially after this week. Uh, so I started out uh, going all the way back to my academic background. I started out in cultural anthropology. Uh, and the main reason was really trying to figure out why I and the, the society at large were making the same mistakes that we've been making for many, many years. Um, and I didn't really know where to go from that necessarily, even though it was always captivating to me. My, uh, my senior advisor was Laura Nader, um, and she's a very, very tough lady to impress. So I had, I, was, I had the chance to develop a lot of skills in systems thinking and critical thinking with her. Uh, but after that, I went through you know, the post-undergrad, what do I do from here? And I ended up in the video game industry as a gamer, um, doing acquisition, behavioral modeling, um, but still really didn't, uh, didn't know how to take all of the skills that I was developing in the for-profit space and translate it into something that would impact the greater good. Uh, so I ended up getting my double master's um, in, uh, from Presidio Graduate School, uh, trying to figure out how do I take all of my analytics experience and put it into the sustainability education plates. Um, and it was, I, honestly, I I'd, I'd never initially thought that I would end up in education. But the more and more I found out about Glass Lab, ended up working for Glass Lab originally as their digital marketing community manager uh, to help with teacher recruitment, pilot studies, uh, getting the word out for why it's gay-based assessments are so important and cool. Um, it really became clear that, that video games have this innate ability to continue to teach you something because as you develop you know, skills in any game, be it like rote memorization of what a certain task, uh, what, what a certain like set of tasks need to be, um, all the way to, you know, unlocking very complex combos in order to, you know, get to the next level. It all requires you to scaffold your understanding and your competency to get there. Uh, in addition to that, especially in the sustainability space, a lot of the mistakes that we're making now in terms of our climate, in terms of how we deal with each other, um, goes back to what, you know, the values that we've learned when we were young. And so having the ability to use new technology and new tools in these spaces and K through 12 particularly have been really pivotal and important for me. Um, and now I'm in workforce readiness, which is great, 
because now it takes that extension from the game-based learning and having you know the capacity to be in an immersive context that you otherwise wouldn't be in before and then translating that to a career opportunity in the future is the next you know natural step so tell us about your role and what you do i think that especially as it relates to the, this combination of collective shift glass lab and <laughs> lrng can you kind of can you kind of unpack the relationships between these different kind of distinct entities not not you know um because you can distinguish them they're not distinct you can distinguish them but they're not you know diametrically opposed from each other so can you tell us what the relationship is between there and then you know where you kind of fit in and and, and articulate here sure so for um and, and so for background for everybody in case um anyone's new not familiar um collective shift is a new 501c3 organization that glass lab um, our original organization merged into um, glass lab games is a game-based learning platform that's focused on uh, it, traditionally in classroom experiences so there are our games with proven learning outcomes and teacher reports that are designed to help you understand what's going on in the game and how can it how can it how it can align to not only academic standards um, but the um, have the ability to have uh, shared instructional context so that in case a student is doing really well or they're doing really poorly um, you have uh, prompts and discussion opportunities available through that reporting uh, to make all of that easier um, the other side is the lrng platform um, which we're currently piloting in 12 cities um, and it was created with the objective to bring connected learning at scale. Um, for additional background, MacArthur Foundation had been doing research on digital media and learning and how youth uh, advance their own learning opportunities and shift the way they learn through the use of technology for many years now. Um, and they were really trying to figure out, well, we have all of these really great in-person programs and summer learning opportunities that are happening. Um, but they're not necessarily connected, uh, nor are they necessarily contextualized for 21st century youth who are trying to figure out, well, how does this actually get me anywhere? So the LRNG platform was created um, with the support from the Glass Lab Tech team in order to uh, make a model that is scalable um, across the country. Um, so the idea there um, is that uh, we have playlists that link together digital experiences with in-person events that are actually going on in your city with the hope that um, over the longer term, we will be able to unlock uh, academic credits or internship opportunities or job opportunities, as well as more community events and exposure for that work. That was very long, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, fantastic. This is, this is your, Sure. So, you know, within within games based learning, you know, there's a there's a trifold uh, with the approaches that we can take. Uh, the first being uh, serious games with serious games or educational games. The second being commercial games within the classroom and the third being the students as designers of games. Mm -hmm. And so within the, ser the more serious and the educational game space that uh, Glass Lab finds itself in. It's really trying to, well, you can articulate this better. It's really trying to grab the good and the best of commercial games, embed them into some uh, formation, and then help to achieve traditional uh, learning games uh, that would uh, be, meet the agenda of a school. Yes, so uh, you, can, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So can you kind of talk about how Glass Lab is really taking those commercial games and making them something different than chocolate covered broccoli and you understand that concept right and, and maybe through sim city edu talk to us about that and battleground 538 and these other these other games sure yeah um sim city uh, sim city edu is actually a great starting point for that and i also apologize i realized i never answered my role question <laughs> um Oh, this, you can go back and answer it. You can answer this, it. Yeah. yeah, we can we can no, answer, answer it that going through the example. Um, so right. for the EDU, um, that was the first donated uh, IP that was uh, given to Glass Lab. And that was through the partnership of uh, Gates and MacArthur, the Entertainment Software Association and Electronic Arts, um, because they were seeing video games as an immense tool, like immensely huge potential 
uh, having immensely huge potential for engagement. So when they donated SimCity, uh, I believe the original statement was, well, clearly this can be used for everything, systems thinking, civic engagement, civil society, political science, history, all that stuff. Not, reali not necessarily realizing that once put in the classroom, we realized it was a six hour game plus. <laughs> and there are so many components and subcomponents and decisions that you have to make that it's near impossible to really create a competency model that could even be uh, instructable and used in a shared context within a classroom. Um, so the game designers eventually modified the game. Um, and this is, this is where we, we start to go into our, our game design journey as Glass Lab, um, is that they ended up modifying the commercial title to have four distinct missions that focus on scaffolded, um, like single component and multiple component, um, I, I guess like uh, scaffolded like systems thinking skills. Um, and so we were able to make them into digestible 10 minute chunks so that if they wanted to be done all in a single class period, they could, or they could space them out over time um, in alignment with the educator's existing curriculum. Um, and we also found that through, through that modification and through the instructional reports that we also designed to go alongside the report, um, in partnership with ETS and Pearson, um, we found uh, there were statistically significant gains in systems thinking. Um, with my favorite anecdote from one of our game designers being he was in a user test with middle school kids in New Jersey. And there was a middle school kid who came up to him and said, so there was a power plant behind my house when I was a kid and somebody put them there. And the game designer said, yes. And he said, a person, yes. Why? <laughs> Which enabled this immensely powerful discussion with, with this middle schooler who had, who had understood why his, generally why the buildings were there, but not that individual people had made policy decisions to actually put them there. Um, which created long-term impacts for his community and so what i help um what we eventually learned from that is that commercial commercial games uh, and how we've designed games to be you know suitable for the learning space um continues to evolve in the sense that there are commercially viable games who have innate learning capacities but may need to be modified there are original learning games um, that are designed um, specifically to teach a single competency which what we've also learned is much more um, it, it's much easier to integrate that into a classroom and then there are commercial games like Civ um, that we're working on now or Civilization for anyone not familiar um, where there is the already an innate ability to teach um, certain aspects of systems thinking historical empathy and it just requires instructional material to get you to that point um, and so what has been really meaningful to me especially uh, at my time at the uh, at Glass Lab has been uh, being part of that whole teacher recruitment process because it has been really pivotal for our work to make sure that teachers and students are actually co-developing with us. Um, it's the hardest thing in the world for anyone trying to get into the learning game space to figure out what the actual pain points are, especially when you know, you're working with youth who have a very different understanding of the learning experience than adults do. Um, but the two things that adults and kids both share is the fear of failure. So when you're dealing with an academic space that may not necessarily be comfortable, or you're dealing with the student that's excelling and needs supplementary material to keep them engaged, um, the development of that, that, how we address that pain point is, is, really like, is really dependent upon whether or not we can actually have those kids and, and uh, students, or students and teachers involved in that process. Um, to backpedal, <laughs> sorry, I went on a bit of a tangent, um, but to backpedal, so my role originally um, was focused on teacher recruitment. So how do we get uh, teachers to regularly engage in our development process? How do we make sure that the reports that we're designing are actually meaningful and useful? Um, and then taking that um, out and making sure that when we're in the ed tech space, when we're like, you know, talking to more uh, game developers who are or and researchers who are trying to get into the work, how do we share those learnings broadly so that it is useful for the broader community? Um, in addition to that, and how it dovetails into my work on the LRNG side as well, um, is continuing to figure out a way to engage and empower youth to develop their own content. So 
Um, for instance, on the LRNG side, we're currently developing uh, Glass Labs game design playlists, um, which uh, take students through the ability to uh, takes through students through what it would be like to design a game, all the way um, starting from paper prototyping to figuring out what careers are actually available in the video game industry. Um, and so part of my work with that as well is making sure that as we're user testing, we're going to the user testing site that we have in the Bay Area called The Mix. Um, we're awesome, love them. Um, as well as going to our youth ambassadors who are also engaged with us regularly to do platform work and research and things like that. So, wow, yeah, that that is fascinating. And so the approach that I hear you're taking is really getting the students involved in that third uh, part that I mentioned, which is children as designers and having them come up with much of the the approaches and the mechanics and the designs of, of how to be engaging and what what types of, of um, aesthetics are necessary, right? You know, you, you don't always need the highest end, even though many, many popular games are of the highest end, um, you know, aesthetics. Because as you can see now, I just saw this. Um, Nintendo is one of the going to be one of the hottest game. Yeah, Nintendo, like old school Nintendo, is going to be one of the hottest Christmas gifts out there with these old two D games that are coming out. It's going to be like sixty. <laughs> like, I can get rid of my emulators. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is crazy. A crazy trend because, yeah. uh, as you can see, uh oh, are you there? Yep. Did we lose it? Nope, I'm here. Oh, no. Is Paula here? Can you still hear me? Yeah, okay, good. The video froze for a hot second. Oh, no. <laughs> you were in a yoga pose. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was meditating. Oh, no, yeah, I think, well, um, I mean, I think it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity as well. And let me know if it echoes. I just took off my headphones. Um, but I think it's, okay. it's, it's been a really, really amazing opportunity uh, to really work with kids because I think when, when we started out, um, um, well, at least when we started out with with LRNG having you know the glass lab games work already like deep in the weeds um it was it was really interesting to actually take take a step back and it was an interesting evolution because in game based learning and in you know traditional classrooms when you're put into a, a specific content space like for games like you own the domain you you can you can have every single telemetry event hitting at exactly like whenever you want and you know exactly what is going on in that game but then you have the question afterwards of like, well, what does what does the student do after that? At the end of the day, like, is it is it that they get a successful like grade in the class? Are they engaging more with their peers in a so uh, so socially emotionally empathetic way? Um, it's really hard to measure those those skills after after the fact. And so when and I guess an interesting point is like when, when LRNG started to go, it really raised questions for me in terms of like, well, how do we bring game-based learning to scale? And how do we, how do we tie that into the real world context so that even if like, if, if you play SimCity for, for one round and you manage to successfully reduce pollution in your city while increasing job growth and making your citizens happy, how can that you know lead you to a policy career how can that lead you to be a community advocate um and the lrng playlist prevent presented like a very fascinating opportunity to figure out well how do we make that real how do we make that impact real and measurable and then how do you connect them to to actual communities that are doing that work um and um and just a fun plug in i'll, I'll mention here is um we actually did a playlist with Boto latino called the brave playlist where um, you have individual experiences that that you know uh, present present topics present present speakers um, talking about bravery and different aspects of bravery um, and how they are very nuanced because every individual is so different and every community is so diverse um, and so having having the bridge between the digital world and the in-person world has been really really cool. So you know, Monica was Monica um, Tracy was just on talking about passion. In design and really starting to connect with the learner really really opening that up first of all knowing yourself that was her main message and then using that to understand the learner and I think you can really connect with that as an anthropologist um, so my question to you now is what do you believe is the learner experience what do you believe the learners are are, are reporting back to you about their experience in contributing to 
their own learning design and contributing and experiencing what are those play testing areas like can you report that to us obviously it's not a first person experience but <laughs> can you report there um what you feel they are 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 saying about this experiences that you have have them engaging in now sure i mean i, th I think every single user testing session that i've been at or um, helped facilitate has very much centered on moving past the point of vulnerability or accepting vulnerability and being able to say, you know what, this is an opportunity space for me. I'm going to go in and just do it and see what happens. Um, a lot of the time when we start to develop new products, playlists, content, um, and we're trying to explore, okay, what, what do we need to do in order to make this succeed? Um, it always comes down to whether or not one, the youth is even willing to look at it. <laughs> And two, whether or not um, it's something that they can contextualize in their own environment. Um, the biggest question that we almost always hear, especially when we're doing playlist development alongside game work, is what does this have to do with me? So like, okay, I can, I can use this game, I can improve my idea of ratios and proportional reasoning and pass the class, when am I ever gonna use this again? Or uh, doing a playlist on financial literacy with, with gap uh, or business readiness. Um, and going through the playlist and going like, oh, I actually do have an interview next week. This would probably be helpful. <laughs> um, having, having, uh, creating a safe space for students and adults too, because we have our own relationship with failure. Um, having the ability to create that safe space is the first step before we can even answer the question of like, can you do it or will you do it? Um, and making sure that when we're cultivating those conversations, it's, it's done from a place of, I want to hear you and I want to listen to you. And that's something that for every user tester that I've, uh, every youth I've ever participated with um, has very much like provided that feedback. It's just like, if I don't, if I don't care, if I don't feel safe, I'm not going to do it. But within the paradigm of that safe space and the ability to, to say what they feel without any sort of retribution um, or, or some, some feeling of like, maybe I just don't get it. Um, it's been it's been really exciting to see because we've seen youth redefi uh, redefine their relationship with failure, and certainly it's 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 on our terms in the sense that we're the we're the people who are maybe initially creating the content, but it's on their terms because they're the ones who get to decide when they try again. Um, and so we'll see youth who have never engaged uh, socially in a classroom or have difficulty socializing in a classroom, but will go through a game and completely understand how a system works um, and how it, how it relates to them. And using those tools has been really, really cool and exciting um, because we've, we've been able to have really meaningful conversations. Um, a funny quote that I will say about an impression I got um, when we were testing um, one of the games was, um, I believe it was, I, I believe it was um, actually an LRG playlist. Um, we had a, a game opportunity in it um, that dealt with business readiness, um, with one of the first experiences being a personality test to see what your work style, to start to think about what your work style was like and how you could convey that knowledge or, or those preferences, <laughs> depending on the context. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the youth who, um, we were working with who had been super quiet the entire session um, was doing the, the group debrief and he said, well, I don't want to be a Matryoshka doll of failure. And so it was really hard for me to look inside myself and understand that like, even though I didn't necessarily identify with everything that was in this content, I know that I will need it and I'm willing to keep exploring it, even though like I never really wanted to before. And, and part of that spoke to the safe space we had, part of that spoke to the fact that we designed our content with youth in mind first. Though we are, though with the knowledge that we are adults, <laughs> like we carry our own assumptions all the time. Um, and, and it's been great to also have a user testing uh, group and, and sets of groups across the country who are very willing now to tell us exactly what they think. <laughs> And it's been it's been overall positive. They've been they've been learning with us as well, so that's been good. They have no problem with that. Let's drill down a little bit, and we're going to double task a little bit on this next question, which is, sure. um, can you dig down a bit deeper into that workforce ed, that workforce kind of training game that you're talking about? And at the same time, can you identify kind of the surface level turnoffs that students are kind of reporting to you as they go through 
those particular games? Like, what, what are the types of turnoffs that they're just not interested in at all? Sure. Um, I mean, for in terms of a workforce readiness game, we're still trying to really sort that out. I mean, SimCity EDU has application as a potential workforce readiness playlist if, you know, if you're thinking about civic engagement or pol political science uh, or city planning. Um, we haven't really, uh, there's, there's very much a distinct difference between the simulations that are often like, say you're doing an engineering course and you do a simulation on how to put components together. That can be a form of workforce readiness gaming if there are game-based pieces in it or, or, or game design pieces in it. Um, but we haven't really necessarily developed one explicitly for that. I'm excited to do that in the future. Mark my words. <laughs> uh, so that'll be really fun. Um, but um, in terms of what turns students off the most, it, they actually are, they tend to be very funny. Um, so when we were doing, uh, research on different games and uh like static like consumable content not in, in person events and things like that um most of them would turned off if it looked like it was from 1997 um so if they were outdated videos <laughs> did not enjoy it whatsoever uh, we're actually working on a, a best buy wearables playlist um with with best buy foundation um and a lot of the we we ended up having to do a lot of iterations and developing our own videos with somebody who um could actually speak to the context from the youth perspective on how to literally program a wearable cuff um because of the fact that it, they they said you know i don't like pdfs <laughs> i don't like videos from 1997 um and i don't uh and a lot of them were also very much visual learners and so reading a lot of text didn't work um, and a lot of that also applies in the game-based learning space. Um, there was a, um, and as another anecdote for some things that, uh, I guess it depends on your age range, but another project that we had worked on in the past was with a, uh, with a company called XStep, and they were doing uh, elementary, like very young uh, math competency testing um, in India. And um, this is the part where user testing becomes really, really pivotal, and you will know what wor <laughs> works and what doesn't. Um, is that we had, uh, it was basically, we were, we were uh, meant to develop a game-based app that students could play in to assess what level of math they were at so that they could be placed appropriately in their schools. Um, what ended up not, not working were um, icons that they couldn't identify. Um, so things like fruit had their own in, like, way, way of being drawn in India that we never even thought of. Um, the representation of characters and people of color was very important. Um, and uh, we ended up also making it uh, a completely nonverbal app because a lot of them, you know, being uh, some, some of them being of lower math level or didn't know English, that became a, a significant barrier to them. So even instructions became very difficult. Um, and so at the end of the day, like, well, we're, we're always going to run into different preferences for how people learn, how people visualize information, how people consume information. Um, but it, it very much comes down to the cultural context as well. So if, um, if, if you're, you're working with, say, uh, youth in communities that aren't necessarily, uh, don't have access or have content deserts that disable them from receiving more information readily or, or being comfortable with receiving information readily, um, something more visual and something more graphic is going to be much more exciting than handing them you know, a pamphlet or handing them a text-based role-playing game, <laughs> for sure. And then others will be very much, you know, a little bit more interested in finding out the narrative, deeping, uh, diving deeper into the content. And then, so more complex game mechanics um, that are much more, um, I guess, like more, much, much more specific in, in the details that um, they provide are, are more beneficial. Sorry, I don't know if that cool. is. Cool, so here's... A <laughs> no, 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 it, it did. It did. Um, you know, understanding what the interests them, you know, I think the aesthetic is, is a big part of what interests them now, you know, and the video game scene is huge. You, you, you start to look across the generational divides and you're going to start to find a lot less millennials or, or X generation or Z generations that do not identify as gamers. And when that happens, then obviously you have all these nuanced cultures within the gaming spheres that are going to start to form and isolate each other, uh, just as states do or cultures do. 
I mean, um, it's, so. Oh, sorry. Go for it. Yeah. No, go ahead, I, was, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, even even now in the commercial space, that that's definitely changing mm -hmm. um, for um, oh, yeah. anyone not not necessarily a gamer who like spends way too many hours playing video games. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, right. There is a game called Overwatch, um, which is oh, uh, yes. Uh, first, yes, a, a first-person yeah. shooter, um, and it it is it it does require like you know shooting, combat, um, lots of movement. Um, but what has been really interesting that B Blizzard has done has been create characters that are very diverse in their representation. So you have a female Russian bodybuilder, you have um, uh, the first uh, Latina pl character that they've ever created who is a cyber hacker who can, mm -hmm. you know, transport herself through different machines and, you know, take control of them. Um, and a lot of the, um, some, well, not a lot, some of the, some, some of the gaming community rose up an uproar saying like oh you know like now like where where are my male characters why like this is pandering but then there's a larger there's a larger and larger portion of the commercial gaming community who's now looking in saying actually this looks like me this feels like me this is something this sounds like me this is something that represents me and so in i i feel like in, in the learning game space like we are we are more attuned to that especially since representation in uh in any learning environment is incredibly crucial to whether uh, and, and impacts whether or not you want you are willing to listen or even be open to that you know opportunity um but we're even seeing it in the commercial gaming space now which is which is really really exciting um and those conversations yeah. are definitely happening <laughs> it is so you've, you've just hit on a great segue to pro social gaming that you have to answer um, <laughs> so we talk about uh, the, the, Nicola um, out of Emergent Africa has this question. She says, she, you mentioned promoting civic engagement, right? More on that. So she's interested in hearing more on that. Any games designed by and for disadvantaged and underserved communities in particular that you guys are working on? Yeah, um, so uh, SimCity EDU is one example. There's a, there's a, I will admit there, there's a bit of a barrier because it is a PC Mac client download. So um, another thing to note with user testing, sometimes we do have to pivot the platform that we're on. Because, you know, if you're independent upon it, strong internet access, if you only have a set number of devices, you have to be very sensitive to that, especially when you're, you're going through the game development process. Um, but another game that I will recommend um, that um, we developed a, a little more than a year ago now, I believe so, is Battleground 538, which is a um, multiplayer game focused on the electoral college system, which pretty topical these days. <laughs> Um, and so that's been that's been really helpful. We and we uh, developed that um, during the White House Game Jam in 2014, um, and then ended up debuting it at the White House Next Gen uh, Summit for High School um, the year after. Um, and what's been really helpful for that is is really just to to kind of like re reset um, the common understanding of the electoral college system, which in itself is not common because it's complicated. <laughs> Um, and unwieldy. Um, but we, we started out with the prompt of what is, what is the topic um, that social studies teachers have a really hard time teaching? What is something that is very difficult to do, that is very difficult for students to question? Um, and they, a lot of the teachers that were in that user testing session um, talked about the electoral college system. And, and uh, Michael John, our game director at the time, was like, well, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> So um, moving forward from that point, uh, they then asked the question, if you had to teach it in a different way, what would that look like? Um, and given the fact that we were focused on high school, um, high school students, um, it ended up being a multiplayer game. So uh, how the game works is you, you each take a side um, or you can do things uh, single player and you can actually go through uh, historical presidential campaigns and you're in the last couple months of your election. You get to make specific decisions about how you spend your money, where you spend your money, uh, and, and pretty much see play by play how that impacts um, the votes as, as you go through. Um, and that's been, that's been really cool because um, a lot of the students that were, were user testing provided the feedback of like, oh, this is something that I would actually play. Um, and then, you know, getting into the broader topic of the electoral college system, they're like, wait, that's real. <laughs> um, 
Um, and so it's, it's been really cool. I, I think in terms of tying, tying games like that into curriculum, tying that into communities that don't necessarily have the capacity or are empowered to be civically minded. Um, a lot of the, the game development work that I've seen and, and will continue to see in the market has been really focused on how do, like, how do we take the commercial gaming mechanics that youth are already comfortable with, already know, and basically tying it into an overarching theme or overarching topic um, that we can then say, that was difficult. This is how you interacted with um, the person you're playing against or playing with. Um, and these are the, this is a, a macro view of some of the real world challenges that we face today. Um, okay, great. So we got one more question that hopefully you can answer quickly and then one last question for you. But uh, how, much, how much can you allow, Heidi, Heidi asked this, how much can you allow students to upload their own content to make it contextualized, localized? Uh, before obviously it becomes so localized that it's it's unusable across a different domain than geographical locations, right? So sure. how do you play with that, that that sensitivity? I mean, for I mean, for at least in the game-based learning space, that's very hard um, because a lot of the time it is based off of what the teacher you know wants to teach and needs to teach, um, and so. Some of the things that we've seen with some teachers that we've worked with in the past has been they've they've taken the pre-existing curriculum that we recommended in case they've never implemented a game before and then adapt it to their own and see how their kids uh, identify with it and accept it or, or, you know, identify opportunities to improve it with their students. Um, in terms of the playlists on LRNG, um, the I, I believe like one of the things that we're really one of the things that we're hoping to do in the future is really provide a, a better space for youth to directly develop content um, right now um, with how our LRNG networks are, are structured um, they're and sorry this isn't like a short answer <laughs> no, it's fine it's fine <laughs> um, 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 so the way the LRNG networks are structured is that we have an anchor organization that works within each city um, to, to work with other youth-based organizations to connect their content together. So the digital experiences alongside the in-person programs that are already happening and don't need to be replaced, right? Um, or just, or just you know, need more visibility. Um, and so while we're continuing to engage these partners, um, part of our work is to also ensure that if they decide to do user testing that they do it in a way that can provide youth with that safe space to provide that feedback and also provide the feedback in a structured way so that it's actually actionable <laughs> because having um a user right, right, right yeah having the user testing structured in a way that's that's not um targeted towards okay a specific action like oh it was just bad it's like well why was it bad um, but having having you know a kit prepared so that the the anchor organizations that we're working with have the ability to do that. Um, the Youth Ambassadors Program, as a as a final plug for the LRG side, um, will be the first to uh, well a few of the first to develop um, the youth uh, youth developed content on LRG. So they'll be the ones coming out with the first round of playlists directly created by youth um, who are doing their own user testing, their own content development, their own research. Um, and so we'll be on the lookout or, or, or be on the lookout uh, for a fireside chat that'll be happening towards the end of the year or early next um, to figure out how they did it and what didn't work. <laughs> nice. So to kind of end our discussion here, we've been asking everyone to answer this question. You know, what inspires you and what impact will you make in this larger education field? What do you think? I think, well, I mean, I could say like Ruth Gator, Bader Ginsburg inspires me. Um, <laughs> but I think um, on a day to day, especially with, you know, this past week, the kids that I work with are, are the people who inspire me the most. They're, they're the people who are continuing to get up. Like they're, they're young people who are willing to get up every single day, um, regardless of fear, regardless of anxiety, regardless of you know, uncertainty about the future because, you know, they're, they're still learning, they're still experiencing things and they don't necessarily have background context for what's going to happen next, right? Neither do we. Um, but they've been, they've been very important for my own personal and professional development um, because 
sometimes it does require, you know, the, the ability to take a step back and have a moment of childish wonderment for yourself and have that moment to just provide not only self-care, but just realize that like, everybody's still going to learn. And the best thing you can do is continue to go. And that's, that's what the kids who are around me do. Um, in terms of what good I want to do in the world, um, I'd love to continue to develop tools with teachers and with students that will make learning more immersive and more interactive. Um, what's been really cool for the Gloss Up Games and LRMG work is that I've been able to be a part of amazing projects that create a shared context and immersive context that most kids probably will, ne will, will not have the ability to do. Like they can't be mayor for a day. Um, they can't run a civilization for a day, um, but they could. And having new tools that don't replace anything but enhance um, the learning experiences that they already have um, has been has been really immensely um, powerful for me. And so I continue I continue to hope to keep doing that just so that I can keep like, I can create help create um, better conversations and inspire youth to change the world in ways that I can't. So wow, that's fantastic. Is really that <laughs> powerful right very like, and i you know we really keep trying good. to find you know on the fly themes but mm -hmm. i think pretty much all of our speakers today it's their passion for their students and um and wanting to see them do well and and you know you, you get back what you give and you definitely shared that with us today <laughs> in, your, in your session that was great it was You're great so we want to thank you for this opportunity <laughs> <laughs> this is a really fun and exciting and we hope that we can continue to keep the conversation going um i you know i didn't ask you permission but i put i put your email in there it's the glasslab.org is that okay yeah absolutely anyone and everyone should always post. reach out <laughs> yeah. reach out to paula at that email really appreciate you and your time and we will chat soon thank you so much for joining us Paula. Thank you so much. Thank you. And feel free to stay on. We, you know, you don't, we don't, we don't yeah. mean to chase you out. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>